Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We are here again at the Beverly Hills Bar Association with part two of our interview about the coronavirus and legal aspects. My name is Natalia Ranovich, and I'm the co-chair of the international section. And we are going to talk today about a contract law, insurance, and who is going to pay the bill for the coronavirus. So here to talk to us today is Malcolm McNeil. Malco has over 35 years of experience in litigation and commercial international transactions. He has uh, experience in cross-border negotiations and has established a network of colleagues through the globe, assisting foreign countries as needs arise. Uh, Malcolm is also the leader of R and Fox International Group, and he's going to share his knowledge today. So, what do you think about this all cont contract law and insurance, and who is going to pay the bill? of all those events that are being delayed. We are here in the entertainment capital of the world. Concerts are being canceled, tours, and a huge gathering of people. So, Sure. Well, th th this is actually a, a, a hotbed of inquiries right now by clients because uh, I've repeatedly told people that in these environments there are winners and losers when, when things like the coronavirus disrupts the business. And uh, it, in the entertainment sector, what we're already hearing is, for example, South by Southwest is one of the latest casualties. The Gaming Industry uh, Association meeting up north was canceled. I was supposed to participate in the Hong Kong Film Mart uh, um, conference, the trade show at the end of this month, uh, and that's been postponed until August. So we're seeing all of these things occur, and those themselves have their own ripple effects. Uh, besides the economic impacts on the participants, uh, for example, uh, if you're an independent filmmaker and you're trying to sell a film, uh, then uh, who are your buyers now? It's going to be much harder to reach those buyers because you don't have this forum and you may have investors for that film that are looking for their investment to get it returned. Um, I happen to be a James Bond fan, as everybody knows, and James Bond, uh, the latest movie, never, uh, No Time to Die, excuse me, No Time to Die uh, has been postponed until November, I think, till Thanksgiving week. And uh, the estimates are that MGM is going to lose $30 million in connection with that uh, that postponement. And that $30 million represents things like uh, the uh, premier sites that they have set up. They were going to have a premier at Royal Albert Hall in uh, London, and they had premieres set up in Tokyo and Beijing and Singapore. So the, the, the first question that arises is will they have to pay those damages to someone? And um, uh, what we typically see as lawyers in contracts are provisions which may be uh, force, what are referred to typically as force majeure uh, provisions. And force majeure basically means some superseding force that makes it impossible or virtually impossible to perform under a contract. So the natural first question is that if you're trying to collect on the contract, you're going to argue that the coronavirus is not a force majeure, that they still have the obligations. If you're the party trying to withdraw from the contract because you've withdrawn from that location, you're going to argue, of course, it was a force majeure. There was no way that you could have predicted it. Uh, there was no way that it could have been factored into the what was contemplated between the parties in connection with the contract, and you're going to be fighting over this, and that, that itself is going to lead to litigation. If the parties have done what they should have done and were prudent to begin with, they may have things that will protect them, such as their insurance, because the insurance coverage is the thing that's the big issue. I read a recent article in Variety about South by Southwest. One of the considerations was that they did not have events cancellation insurance. So now there's going to be an all likelihood litigation that is going to arise out of the South by Southwest cancellation. I hear also through anecdotal information that the same thing exists in connection with the Cannes Film Festival. So what you have now are situations where events which have a tremendous number of side events that attach to them. You have people that attend. You have the hotels that are booked ahead of time. You have the venues. You have performers who are being paid ahead of time. And whether or not the, all of those folks are going to be able to make claims you would hope to turn to an insurance policy and get that uh, some insurance coverage. There is such a thing as events uh, cancellation coverage, and you can buy it. And unfortunately, because of the rarity of 
the cancellation of events, many of the organizers don't buy that insurance. And if they did, they could sort of turn that whole bundle of claims over to their insurance carrier. There's another one where what happens if the, if the business shuts down and you just cannot act uh, and, and conduct your business and you have to shut the doors and send everybody home. Well, there's other coverage that attaches to that. It's called business interruption insurance. So if you were fortunate enough and, and forward thinking enough to get your insurance coverage and, to, uh, and make sure that you have business interruption insurance, you could go ahead and use that as one of the means to, to cover the losses. And you would probably be able to do so if you kept meticulous records and you would then be uh, challenging the insurance company to fully compensate you for it. There are a lot of people out there that enter into obligations and they can't afford to uh, pay those obligations if they arise. So if one of those uh, parties that you've contracted with who is supposed to use your venue or otherwise uh, provide services and they're not providing those services and they owe you money, you could get credit insurance. Credit insurance is another avenue that people can um, use to, to, that if that company goes bankrupt or otherwise doesn't pay, the insurance company steps in and steps into your shoes and then they'll go after the debtor, the party that owes the money and, and hope to receive that money. Um, the, the, the lesson to be learned from all of this are that these are avenues and people, as we know, are typically reluctant to buy extended coverage. So they don't want to pay the additional premium. They think the, it is too remote, the possibility or the, the, the possibility of a loss. So they don't purchase those, those policies. Now in the post-coronavirus world, the question is going to be, well, maybe we should reassess whether or not we're, we're the premium is worth it and whether or not we should factor that premium into the costs of putting on our event. So I'm advising everybody to review your insurance policies, make sure you understand them, review them with your agent or broker, and then talk to me about it. Let me know what's going on because sometimes people don't get the most accurate information from their agent or broker because they're providing anecdotal advice on what the coverage is based on the name, but they're not quite sure what may in fact be covered. Read the, the provisions of that insurance contract. In the non-insurance environment for the force majeure provisions, they may have to be particularly suited to your situation. Uh, it's a different situation if you're contracting with an artist. It's a different situation if you're contracting with a venue. It's a different situation if you're the venue contracting with somebody else. If you're the venue, you want the force majeure provision to be very, very narrow so that people will still have an obligation to pay you for the venue if it cancels. If you're the other party, you want a very broad force majeure provision because I one of the disputes now is whether or not uh, under the natural disasters provision, whether or not um, it would be deemed that the coronavirus would be deemed to be a natural disaster. Obviously, if you're affected financially from it, for you, it's a natural disaster. For the party who wants to get paid, they're saying, no, that's no natural disaster. So the question is going to be that we have to look at these provisions and read them more carefully and, and adopt them and adapt them for our business issues. Yeah, so I think the lesson to be learned here is to read your contract, see what the provisions are before you take any action. Abs and yeah. seek legal advice. That's what we <laughs> yes, know. Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Mark. Thank you, Natalia. <laughs>